It is NFC North week. EJ, I'm excited. You know why I'm excited? No. This, I shouldn't be this excited about the Lions, but I am. Because on that whiteboard way behind oh. me, I was putting together my season travel schedule for this year. All the games I'm going to. It's like eight or nine games. Actually, more than that. It's like double-digit games I'm going to. One of them is a game that I was forewarned not to go to. I was told it was going to be a land of depression and misery. Lions at Jets in December, outdoors in New York. And I said, you know what? No, that sounds like a grand old time because I believe in these Lions. I think that they have talent. I think they have a future. I'm going to go see them live with probably the cheapest tickets I'll get for them all year long, an outdoor game in December against the Jets. But it's going to be fun. I can't wait. Uh, I, I have a lot of positive things to say about the Lions and how they built their team. I know that you do as well. But before we get into all of that, EJ, buddy, how you doing? What are you drinking on this fine Monday morning? Technically, it's when it releases, but we're recording this on a Sunday. How are you? Yes, in podcast land, this is Monday morning. In reality, it ain't. So I'm drinking coffee. I, too, have many positive things to say about the Lions, which is weird as a longtime Bears fan, uh, but a lot of positive momentum in in lion's land over the last couple of years and they've continued they've had a couple of strong off seasons in a row now like what they're building in detroit and we get to talk about it for an hour so let's uh let's dive in well we're not going to waste any time getting into how we start off every one of these team preview episodes we're 20 30 something into it at this point um like time has lost all meaning to me yeah. <laughs> but we're gonna do a little 2021 recap uh and kind of looking at where things ended up before we get into all the off-season moves to get us from january to now but between september and january of last year obviously last in the division home record three and five road record winless they did not pick up a single road win but in the last five you know we talk about how they're three and 13 in the last five two of those three wins came in their final five games so they by lion standards picked up some momentum going into the off season i do want to issue a little bit of a disclaimer that three and 13 record is very deceiving because oh my god some of the games that the lions lost should not have been losses they were horrible horrible either just bad luck or crazy circumstances there was the ravens um, and Justin Tucker literally having to break an NFL record on a game-winning field goal just to beat them. 3-13. and 13, This was not a 3-13 and 13 team. They were better than that. They just happened to go 3-13. and 13. And I, man, I don't know how Lions fans made it through last year. Because even though they didn't expect them to be good, the amount of heartbreaking, I mean heartbreaking losses was unfathomable even for a quote-unquote bottom tier team it was crazy yeah you could double the amount of wins they had last year and not blink an eye in few plays we say it all the time it's a game of inches really played out like that for the lions and while it was that painful last year and it was very painful i actually think it might play into their favor it's a lot of people that look at this team and go come on it's a three-win team it's not a three-win team could have easily been a six win team or maybe even seven with just like you said minimal amount of breaks going their way and if there was seven win team last year there would be a different level of expectation and a different level of sort of maybe not looking past them this year Smart teams won't do that. Smart teams will watch the film and say, hey, this is a talented team. You don't want to you don't want to take a week off against this team. And that's the culture that Dan Campbell's been building since he arrived. But it gives them an advantage because in the back of people's heads, you know, even players in the division, I'm sure there's some that's like, it's the Lions. It's the same old Lions. 0-8 on the road. Three win game. Three win team. Ah, we, you know, we can kind of we can give it half and still beat the Lions good luck i don't Mm -hmm. think that's the case this year yeah it's just it's an exciting program because i think we've seen the heartbeat and and we know where it's going and we know where it's heading and we believe in the people that are uh steering the ship so to speak which is probably the best transition i'll ever have to looking at their uh 
you know, leadership from the top down. We do this for every single team. EVP and GM, Brad Holmes, year two coming over from LA, uh, which probably helps explain the Jared Goff trade in the first place because he was very familiar with Jared Goff and he knew what he was getting with Jared Goff uh, and kind of facilitated that Stafford trade to LA, picked up extra assets. Obviously, Stafford won a Super Bowl in LA, so happy ending for him. And even though Jared Goff is not remotely the same caliber quarterback as Stafford, I still do think that he acquitted himself pretty well considering the circumstances around him in Detroit last year. There were actually plenty of flashes where Jared Goff looked like a capable starting quarterback. Top-tier starter? No. Capable? Absolutely. And I think the use of assets that Detroit got out of that trade was also very good. I think that it will never quite be even because the team that gets Matthew Stafford is always going to be the ultimate winner, especially when they won a Super Bowl. But it's not like the Lions got fleeced here. They did get plenty of stuff back for their trouble. Uh, So Brad Holmes, year two at GM for him and AVP. Dan Campbell, year two at head coach. And um, I think you and I are both pretty big fans of what Dan Campbell brings to that building, which is culture builder, keeping the locker room together. A lot of lesser men, for lack of a better term, would have lost the locker room last year with how Mm -hmm. horrific some of those losses were. But everybody was bought in from the start. That locker room loves Dan Campbell. Um, Some guys, I think, probably took less money to be there this year when you look at some of their retentions and signees and everything like that. I, I think... I think word spread pretty quickly among the NFL that Dan Campbell is somebody that you really want to play for and somebody you want to be around and somebody that you can buy into and believe in. He's a great, great human being, a great leader in exactly what that franchise needs. And I don't want to compare him too much to like a John Harbaugh type coach, but I think that based on the buy-in that we saw from that locker room, it reminds me of a John Harbaugh whose one job is to keep the building together. That's what Dan Campbell does. Uh, assistant head coach and running backs coach Deuce Staley also there year two one of the best running back teachers in the entire league and also an ex- a very experienced coach so having him as your assistant head coach is great uh, Ben Johnson year four with the organization he actually carried over from the previous regime uh, first year at OC one of the reasons why he carried over by the way is because he worked with Dan Campbell down in Miami he has experience as a receivers coach and a tight ends coach and a in general offensive quality control was down in Miami when Campbell was the interim head coach there so they had experience together kept him on now he goes from tight ends coach to offensive coordinator his first year uh, defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn you and I both big fans of him both as a DB coach and I think what he can bring to the table as a defensive coordinator you saw some really fun um, you know three safety packages with him last year that almost worked if they had better safeties which they're certainly trying to get um, he, he was trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit and almost was successful but uh, again we see the vision we see where it's going we see the direction I'm excited to see what he does once he gets better talent to work with. And uh, Dave Fitt, also year two at special teams coordinator. He spent a long time as the Eagles special teams coordinator prior to being in Detroit. So uh, kind of a mix of young blood at head coach and coordinator, in addition to some very uh, experienced assistants to help kind of guide things along. I really love top to bottom, the, the power structure in Detroit. I think it's fun. I think they're aggressive. I think they know what they want, what they like, and how they want to build this thing, and they are well on their way to doing that. It feels lined up to me. It feels like they are aligned, especially Holmes and Campbell seem in lockstep. That handshake seems firm and secure. They came in together. They understand the change that's necessary, the changes that have been necessary to create an atmosphere and a culture and a roster in Detroit that is annually competitive for real. They didn't shy away from the enormity of that task. It was a big task, make no mistake. That's not a a culture or tradition that's been carried on in Detroit recently or, or even into sort of deeper history. The fact that they've got coaches like Staley and Aaron Glenn lined up. The one place where I feel like they're still figuring out how it's going to work, and we saw this play out last year, is 
offense and offensive play caller. Like Dan mm-hmm. Campbell inserted himself into that discussion, said, no, I'm taking it back. It's my responsibility. Gave it away, showed some uncertainty there. Uh, they're still they're still figuring it out. I'm interested to see how Ben Johnson's play calls evolve and how hands-on or off Campbell is going to be when that succeeds or fails, both, right, um, in terms of how long that leash is going to be. But as far as the overall remake of the building, it doesn't feel at all the same to me. And I've you know been a Lions watcher for a long time as an NFC North fan. And this group at the top feels united and like they are pulling towards a goal that people are believing in. And that, I think, sometimes gets understated by experience or where people came from or what system is this sort of, you know, hot start of the moment. It doesn't feel at all like that. This feels foundational in Detroit, and that alone makes it different. Foundational is, is probably the, the best word for it. As you said, uh, you know you can't really build a house without having a solid foundation, and they absolutely have that, at least within the decision makers in the building. Um, but all the assistant coaches underneath that top layer, I think, are a good reflection of Dan Campbell as well. You know, he's a former player. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why he connects so well with players is because he was one of them, and there are former players little littered all over this coaching staff, both on offense and defense. I think it's a player-friendly staff, and it's easy to buy into because all of them used to be wearing pads themselves. It's a fun group. The notable coaches in Detroit, as I went through and put this together, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, On offense, Mark Brunel, quarterback's coach, former Husky, so well-known to me, and Jacksonville Jaguar, has had a lot of success and is you know, at this point, getting to be a football lifer. This is not something new for Mark Brunel. Hank Fraley, the offensive line coach, former NFL offensive lineman, then be familiar to a lot of folks, played 11 seasons after being at UDFA. This is my UDFA plug uh, (laughs) for the Eagles, Browns, and Rams. Hank was a tremendously successful lineman in the league, not just somebody who played a long time. Uh, Gets to work with a very talented young group in Detroit. We'll talk about that as we go on, but that's talk about building a foundation and building from the core. We talked about this in our preview last year of the Lions that, man, regardless of who the quarterback's going to be eventually, they're building a very stout young offensive line in front of them. And Antoine Randall L. is the wide receivers coach there. He is a former NFL QB and wide receiver uh, for the Steelers in Washington. Uh, Fun player for those of you that uh, maybe came to the NFL a little bit later and didn't get to see Antoine Randall L. play. Really interesting. I think would have a completely different role in the modern NFL. Oh, he's way before his time. Yeah, he was one of the trendsetters in that category. On defense and special teams, Aubrey Pleasant, the defensive backs coach and pass game coordinator. We see this combination more often. We've seen this already from three or four teams in our previews. Uh, Spent four years uh, as the Rams cornerback coach and played safety himself at Wisconsin during his college days. And Kevin Shepard is the linebackers coach, former NFL linebacker with the Bills, Colts, Dolphins, Giants, and Lions. So there's that connection coming back to the franchise to coach where he played. So like you said, a uh, really interesting group of coaches, many of them players themselves, uh, many of them very successful players. Uh, all the players I named had some great success in their NFL careers. I think, uh, you know, if not Dan Campbell, but also Brad Holmes in looking at bringing folks into the organization as leaders, as folks that are going to set the tone. We're like, yeah, we want winners. We want folks that know how to do it and have done it at a high level. We're going to, We're going to see the staff with a bunch of those players and everywhere a player looks, if they're a Detroit Lion, they're going to say, and that guy knows how to do it because he won. And that guy knows how to do it because he won. Um, They can tell us how to win and we believe them. In terms of uh, free agency losses, I use the term losses very loosely here. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) More of addition by subtraction, looking at at the, the people that are no longer on the roster. There weren't really any key players gone from last year to this year because there weren't a 
whole lot of key players, period. But um, in terms of the ones that are no longer there, it's all either rotational guys or depth pieces or starters that just quite frankly were not playing starting caliber. Like Dean Marlowe was their third safety. I mentioned Aaron Glenn is a really big fan of three safety packages. Marlowe was the third one, and he wasn't particularly effective at it. So they brought in a new guy uh, who we'll talk about in a second to fill that role who should be much, much better and a massive improvement. Uh, Jalen reeves Maben, their linebacking core was atrocious last year, and and, and at least on, on the starters. They have some young guys as in backup roles we like, but the starting linebackers were not good at all, and I think that reeves Maben was just somebody who they wanted to, to move on from and allow some of the young blood that they have accumulated to get more snaps because couldn't possibly be worse uh nick williams uh it's kind of like an undersized rotational guy for them only played about half the snaps but he was horrific in run defense so that's something that dan campbell will not abide you have to be able to run the ball and stop the run he could not do his half of the equation there so they let him go and then trey flowers who is a good player but could not stay healthy was banged up basically most of the last two years so at some point you know especially if they knew going into the offseason like hey we have the second overall pick we kind of want to improve edge let's kind of move on from trey here um and and you know open up a spot for some of the other young guns we're going to talk about they actually have a couple really good young edge players we'll talk about there, there just wasn't really space for trey flowers anymore especially because he just gets hurt constantly at this point so there there wasn't a whole lot of of key players to talk about it was mostly just guys that got a lot of snaps but who were not worth keeping around um and i I think that quite frankly none of these guys will be missed felt more like clearing the decks to me the one that i was somewhat surprised and a little bit sad about was nick williams uh not because he played well you were correct he did not play well he played really well in his contract year in chicago hence got signed by Detroit and never matched that level of play in Detroit that he showed in that last year in Chicago where he was really effective and looked like a player who the light had come on for was rising got paid didn't happen for him and I think wisely Detroit moved on from him and others that were making some money and not uh, creating a better product on the field we'll put it that way and some was to make space some was to clear cap space um and again not a ton of them and just let's let's keep this going let's show our players uh in a positive way that you know if you're not doing it we're not going to abide by that we are going to move on now in terms of retentions this might be the longest retention list that we see uh you know the lions did have money to work with but they Instead of allocating it to a small number of stars, because they didn't really have a whole lot of stars, they spread it around through a lot of different guys. I think they have over like 20 retentions, if I look at the entire list and if I counted it up. Most of them are either role players or depth pieces or, you know, Charles Harris was as close to a star as you can expect from last year's edge rotation, but he was extremely effective in terms of pressure rate. He was in the... the upper tier of the league but because he his career hadn't really taken that turn to him producing like that until he got to the lions he came at a massive discount for retention so he's only six and a half million and him and tracy walker were the two most expensive retentions they had and and walker even himself in the current safety market is like 40 percent the cost of minka for a starting safety who is a good player and is effective he's only 8.3 million so they, they took all the money they had and they really spread it across a wide swath of players to retain depth. That was the number thing number one thing they wanted to do, which identified the depth players that were effective for them and were worth the money. Let the ones that weren't worth it go. Retain the depth so that they could really focus on the draft uh, in terms of getting those stars that they wanted, which they were aggressive in the draft and did that. I personally agree heavily with this approach because stars don't mean a whole lot in the NFL if the other 80% of your roster is worth dick. So kind of building the depth first and then trying to draft the stars rather than buy the stars 
that's the approach that I would take as well. And so I, I think that they, they, they're they doing it right in Detroit. Uh, you know, Harris, six and a half million for an effective edge rusher. Reynolds for a wide receiver three, wide receiver four, three million. Anzalone, I use the term loosely, best linebacker from last year, but he's only three million. And he might end up losing snaps to some of the young guys that I like even better anyway. Um you know, uh, Brock Wright, a blocking tight end. The Dan Campbell special, less than a million. Tommy Kramer, a backup depth guard, less than a million. Retain the depth, draft the stars. That's their approach. And in the long term, maybe not 2022, but 2023, 2024, I think it's going to work out for them. It also lets them get culture fit on all these players. Last year when we were looking, it was regime change over year. So, of course, there was going to be a lot of players going out, a lot of players coming in. And they signed a lot of guys to one-year deals, minimums, minimum two-year deals, basically trial deals with almost no guaranteed money, very low overall cost in general. It lets them come in and say, are you going to buy into the program? Do you fit? Do you fit mentally? Uh, and you know, the guys that went through a year worth of the program that fit, that fit mentally, they said, we're going to reward you. We're going to keep you. We're not going to pay you a ton, which was smart. I, Josh Reynolds is the value on this list for me at only $3 million for a very effective wide receiver, three or four, depending on how you see him on this roster. Charles Harris made sense as an edge rusher in terms of money. And Tracy Walker, a guy that's important to their defensive scheme. Those are the Walker and Harris are the only two guys, the top 3 million on this list. Everybody mm -hmm. else was less than 3 million Reynolds, right at 3 million Anzalone, who you mentioned two and a quarter and everybody else is pretty much at like one, five, 895,000, 1 million, 1 1.2 million and a ton of guys. But these are all guys that they basically had a free trial period with and said, Nope, we want to keep you. We like you. You fit in our program, but you are our base layer. You are our, you know, piece that we're going to build off of and add higher profile players to in both free agency and the draft. In terms of third party additions, again, kind of more of the same, um, you know, not spending a whole lot with the one exception of DJ Chark, who got uh, 10 million on what is essentially a one year deal. It's it's not really a three year deal. The last two were void years. So it's basically a one year mercenary contract of, hey, we really need to get a deep threat. And at the time, they weren't 100% sure they were going to be able to get Jamison Williams, who they really, really wanted and really were targeting. So they're like, just to make sure we at least have one, let's go spend $10 million on DJ Chark. Um, but everybody else on the list, same kind of thing as their retentions. You know, Mike Hughes to be a likely a starting nickel for them at two and a quarter million. Uh, Deshaun Elliott, who's going to be the new third safety for them to replace Marlowe and be much better at it if he's healthy. He's at 1.1, which is incredible value for the type of player he is. Um, you know, Chris Board at 2 million. It's it's just depth and contributors and then one little flyer on a mercenary contract that they're going to be getting out of in a year anyway. And then relying on the draft to really build with the foundational star pieces who we'll get to in a second. I love this approach. It's more of the same with the retentions, just with the one little exception to DJ, to DJ Chark, excuse me. I If I was Brad Holmes, I would have done the exact same thing. And it's not even really when you look at Chark. I mean, you're talking about wide receiver ones with which Chark was in Jacksonville when he was healthy, getting 18, 20, 22 million dollars a year. Yes, he was injured. Yes, he's coming off an injury, but seems to be healing properly. You pay half that. Mercenary or not, you go 10 million. Still a real value signing. Elliot for just over a million, 1.1 is complete thievery. I'm not saying he should be making five or eight or 10 million, but one, one is again, we're just going to wait for value. Ooh, that guy fits our system. He hits like a, just a load of bricks every time we've got a role for him. He's better than the guy we had. Let's go wait, 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 pay below market value in my opinion. And, you know, sign him up for $1.1 million. The guys like Chris Board, Mike Hughes is going to be, again, he's going to play a lot of snaps. He's absolutely going to outplay the two and a quarter million in terms of number of snaps per dollars paid. He'll have one of the best ratios in the league for that because he's going to play a lot of snaps in this Detroit secondary. And again, less than $3 million for a contributing starter who plays at a fairly high level. That's a thing. DJ Chark, high level player, half. 
Mike Hughes, solid to, you know, average to above average player at his position for his position, I'd say about a third. I would say mm-hmm. you'd normally pay five, six million dollars for that player. They paid two and a quarter. Just Brad Holmes waiting, not overpaying, saying, yeah, look, we do need to dip into an expensive position in free agency. We we do need more star power at wide receiver. Going to hedge my bets. I want it in the draft, but I'm not sure I'm going to get it. So I'm going to go get a guy that was a number one, showing that kind of contribution, was injured, a little bit under the radar. I'm, I'm going to sign him, but I'm not going to, you know, just lay my checkbook open in front of him and say, what do you want? So really restrained approach that's targeted just smart now in terms of the draft again this is where i think keeping with the theme of building the foundation this is where the stars come because top to bottom i think we talked about them in our our best drafts episode if i recall correctly we were losing our mind over not just what they did at the top but what they did at the bottom they got i'm not even kidding seven guys who within two years I could see being starters for them. It's it's absolutely unconscionable that they were able to get this much value in one draft class, especially when they needed it most, when they are trying to build this program from the ground up. Starts right off at the top, and this was a pick of, you know, much intrigue. Who's going to be there? Who do they want? Who fits that culture? Who fits that program? I couldn't have hit it sort of more nail on the head than round one pick two. Aiden Hutchinson, the defensive end out of Michigan, he gets to stay at home. Uh, If ever there was a Dan Campbell player, it's Aiden (laughs) Hutchinson. Uh, They have continued to try. Last year they built the interior of the defensive line. Now they move to the exterior rushers. Hutchinson, one of the most versatile, uh, highest motor, most effective players at that position in this draft they stay there there was some are they going to trade back and get value nope they say this is our guy he's local he fits our need he fits our culture 100 percent. we're just going to do it the second pick they have in round one at pick 12 so again two picks in the top 12 it's a lot of ammunition they know they still need wide receiver they really wanted jameson williams they like really really wanted jameson williams and i completely understand why if he was 100 percent healthy he was the clear number one even above guys like pickens in this class for me because his ability to break things is special he can take nothing passes and go 70 yards on any given play against anybody proved it in college lions need that kind of threat they were overjoyed to get Jameson Williams at pick 12 second round pick 46 one of both our favorites pre-draft Josh Pascal the defensive end from Kentucky again they built the inside Pascal is more outside you know he's anywhere from three to five but I think probably best at like five so Mm -hmm. last year they got their two sort of you could say they're not bookend book interiors for the defensive (laughs) tackles and then they go for their defensive bookends Uh, both tremendous players great values pick three they get kirby joseph the safety out of illinois or sorry round three pick 97 kirby joseph safety out of illinois um athlete this was the one that was a little bit early for me again it's top 100 i don't think i would have picked joseph there ahead of some others they really look at that safety position and say he's going to bring something to our program that we really want so i'm going to give him a pass they skip down they don't have a round four pick in round five pick 177 one of my favorite picks of the entire draft james mitchell the tight end out of virginia tech james mitchell in 2020 looked like one of the top tight ends in the nation he was emerging as an all-around threat for virginia tech had some amazing games gets hurt early in the 2021 season moving into the draft he gets forgotten a little bit he was way up on my tight end list he was like tight end four or five overall Mm -hmm. for me they steal him way down um round five pick 177 as a bears fan mark my words i'm gonna end up hating this pick for detroit (laughs) james mitchell is gonna make a bunch of plays for them i know they have hawkinson and he is a tremendous player i'm not saying he's going to displace him but if you can play hawkinson and mitchell you need a lot less wide receiver talent because both of those guys can make high level plays in the passing game and i think 
Jared Goff has shown the ability over the years to hit the tight end. Did so in in L.A. If he starts doing it here, the James Mitchell pick in the fifth is going to look like absolute thievery. Two picks in round six. The first one, 188, one of your favorites, Malcolm Rodriguez, the linebacker out of Oklahoma State. A little bit undersized, really active. Ton of speed brings them a little bit of a different skill set from what they had. And, yes, they need inside linebacking. Rodriguez is a good pick there. Second pick in round six, 217. James Houston, the fourth linebacker out of Jackson State. Didn't watch him, so I don't know what he brings. But again, if you're going to pick a position on this roster down in the draft, grab a special teamer and hope you hit. Inside linebacker is a good choice. And round seven, pick 237 overall. Chase Lucas, the cornerback out of Arizona State, who we got really familiar with uh, at the Shrine Bowl, not only on the field, but uh, got a chance to sit down and interview him. Great player, uh, huge talker, leader on defense. I can see him sitting behind, uh, you know, oh, sorry, Mike Hughes, and learning a lot this year and moving into competition for that role next year, even as a starter. Yes, a guy picked in the seventh round has that kind of ability. And if he gets up to speed, um, even sits on the practice squad this year, I don't really care. He's going to learn a lot and I think has the mental makeup to play that spot, uh, which is really, really important when you're talking about an inside corner. For once, there's a day three guy that I've watched that you haven't. And that's dum, James dum, Houston. Dum. Jackson State. Uh, so I know he's listed as linebacker for them. He's going to play edge. He's six foot, 245. That might 39 be inch me vert. Off. I might have watched a different him. James Houston. No, I'm thinking I was thinking linebacker James Houston, and I was like, I didn't watch a linebacker named James Houston, but the edge part just it's like rang it's my bell. Quote unquote linebacker, but like not really because he's he's an edge. He's, he had a shit ton of production at Jackson State. I think he was uh, conference defensive player of the year, if I recall correctly. But uh, six foot two forty five, thirty nine inch for ten five in the broad. Um, 34 and a half inch arms, by the way, which in that kind of compact frame with explosion is absolutely what you're looking for. Again, six round pick, but he is just a fire breather off the edge. And I think he definitely has a shot to get in the mix with their edge rotation, which is a lot more crowded now than it was a couple years ago because you got Aiden Hutchinson, Josh, Josh Pascal can get snaps out there. Charles Harris played really well. Uh, you got both of the Aquaras, who I think are absolutely worthy of snaps, or not even more, more than worthy of snaps. <laughs> um, and then you got James Houston. So they're, theoretically speaking, six deep at edge. It, it might be the deepest, I'm talking about top end talent, the deepest edge rotation in the entire league because there's literally six of them. And there's going to be a third down package at some point where you're going to get Aiden Hutchinson, Josh Pascal next to each other. And then on the other side, out of the two, I would have Harris and then either one of the Aquaras or Houston next to each other. This is going to be like third and 15. You know, you're never breaking this out on on rundowns. That's going to be a nightmare to block. Because it's so much speed, it's so much explosiveness, especially when it comes to Pascal. There's there's that power element that comes with him, too. I'm a massive fan of Pascal. I had a, a round one grade on him. He was one of my highest graded edges in this class. Even though he's a different type of edge from a lot of the other ones that I had in that tier, he's a bigger, thicker body, more of a inside-slash-outside kind of guy. For them, I think he'll probably be... If they're lining up to the strength of the formation, he'll he'll be like the six technique over the tight end and just absolutely beat the shit out of tight ends in the run game. And then you got Hutchinson over on the weak side edge. It, it, it I'm not entirely sure how they're going to line up, but I think that's how they'll do it. And then the inside, you got you know Onwuzurike and um, I think they st- uh, Lee McNeil was who they yep. took. Yeah, you, know, you still got Brockers. So I, I would I would imagine Pass was going to be six, and then Aiden's going to be like the the ghost nine on the weak side and just the, the rotation, like nobody's going to have to play more than 30% of the snaps. Nobody ever. And not because they're not great. It's just, they won't have to. So everybody's going to be fresh all the time. Everybody's going to be playing a hundred miles an hour all the time. Like this defensive front is just so fun. Uh, the Malcolm Rodriguez pick for me, uh, 
one of the more necessary picks, I would say, in this class because linebacker's been, for lack of a better word, dog shit uh, for them the last couple of years. Alex Anzalone was their best guy. Again, I use that term loosely, but Rodriguez, I think, has the talent to be even better. Super explosive, super rangy, small. I'll give you that. He's like 5'11", 230, so he's like a sawed-off shotgun. But he's extremely explosive, and nothing's getting outside of him. And he's really feisty, too, when taking on blocks. And then you combine him with, um, you know, the other guys they got there with Derek Barnes, who's a bigger, thicker body, you know, really good as a blitzer. At least he was in college. Jared Davis is now back for round two, might be round three with Detroit at this point. And then Sean Dion Hamilton. So the linebacking rotation or core is better than it was last year. But I do think that Rodriguez offers an element of speed and explosion that none of the other guys do. Um, and then I, I do want to give a little bit of credit to Chase Lucas, even though they signed Hughes to be nickel. I think Lucas will push for it because he's a really, really good inside DB, not outside. I, I did not like him as much outside as I do inside. Um, in fact, there was I had some thought of maybe doing a safety conversion with him because I thought he's a lot. If we're just kind of you know playing down the middle, somebody who tackles well, plays the run well. Um, all that kind of stuff. And if he's got linebacker help to the inside, you know, he's, he's better as a nickel than outside. I, I just don't quite think he has the speed to be a pure outside guy. So maybe they'll look at a safety conversion with him. But if they want to leave him at nickel, I think he could push Hughes for that job because of how well he tackles and how aggressive he is against the run. He's a good blitzer, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I, I, I can't talk about this draft class without addressing Jameson Williams going to be Jared Goff's best friend once he finally gets on the field, which who knows how long that's going to be, but you get Jameson Williams, DJ Chark, and Amon Ross St. Brown on the field at the same time with Hawkinson and Swift. Like That is so much speed and explosiveness and shiftiness. Good luck trying to play man against that. I would be scared shitless to play man. I really would, and it's it's going to be awesome, especially at that offensive line, which they've rebuilt over the last few years. It's a great young offensive line. There's talent, man. There's talent, and not just on the defensive front, but on the offensive front and the skill positions, and now finally in the secondary too. There's not a whole lot in this roster that I'm not completely in love with other than maybe linebacker, maybe, maybe quarterback, We'll see what happens with Goff. Other than that, there's nothing wrong anymore. There's really nothing wrong. It's a it's a deeper, more talented roster than Detroit has had since like prime Stafford Megatron Sioux years where they were pushing for the playoffs back then. It's been 10 years since that. They're finally back to that point where I can say Detroit legitimately has a good roster. They have a good roster. I would say they're a tick under that team you just mentioned in terms of high-end star power that has yet to prove it. They have a lot of young guys lined up from the draft, specifically over the last couple of years, that can prove it this year. If they do, I'd say by the end of this season, they start to resemble those teams, those very talented Detroit teams that could never finish it. But any defensive lineup that has Pascal in the third string or as the sixth guy at his position – is plenty well stocked. Josh Pascal, I do not think will be there by year's end. And that's saying something because I like the guys ahead of him in that lineup as well. It's a very talented player, a lot of power, good moves. One of the more sort of versatile, I had him as defensive end, you know, fives in this class that can rush, can absolutely stop the run, throw guys around on the inside, really good at stunts. Did a lot of stunts at Kentucky where he was the guy looping inside, and that's a nightmare because if you have a smaller center sort of turning to catch him, ugh, not a great look. So really good draft class, again, gives them flexibility. Goff's really interesting. It's We always talk about the quarterback on these shows because it's really important. Goff plays at a level I think they are comfortable with, and I think a lot of folks outside Detroit say, no, no, they're they're chomping at the bit to replace Jared Goff. They're not. They're comfortable with what they have. They understand what he can bring, and they're trying to arrange him within that envelope so he can be as effective as possible. 
they everybody said oh they're just doing it for a salary dump they're just doing it for a piece right no they were they were happy like you said Holmes was very familiar with golf they knew what they were getting and largely they have gotten what they thought they were going to get when they got him he has not underperformed for the most part he has performed he is a known he is a guy that has a lot of starting reps he's not one of those like backups that somebody trades for and you hope he's good like they knew what they were getting so they're okay with him guiding this ship and again they're building talent around him through this season and then we'll see if he's able to elevate them cool he could have a longer future in detroit if he's not they will go grab a quarterback and uh, you know put him in the middle of this very talented halo and say let's go get it so they've they've lined themselves up really well they didn't stop with the draft. They had a very successful undrafted free agency class as well. Um, bunch of players coming in. Uh, I didn't highlight Greg Bell from San Diego State, the running back, but I think he's got a sort of pounder's chance to to make that lineup. Mm-hmm. Josh Johnson, the wide receiver from Tulsa, guy we got to sit with. One of the first guys at Shrine Bowl that caught my eye literally walked onto the corner of the UNLV practice fields. They were fielding punts before practice. It's like, mm, who's that guy? <laughs> Look at your roster. Oh, it's Josh Johnson from Tulsa. Like, that guy's got some zip. So, offers special teams versatility. Um, again, wide receiving help. Detroit, good match. He's got a chance to make the roster. Derek Dees Jr., the tight end from San Jose State. We already talked about the tight end talent they have, the tight end talent they drafted. It's a deep room. I still think Derek Deese probably makes the team. He was, this was a very deep tight end class for the first time in two or three years. Derek Deese was down the board, but when you went and watched Mm -hmm. him, he does it all. He's a big guy. He can block. He's, I would say, surprisingly effective in the pass game. Uh, He runs a little funny for lack of a better term he's not the smoothest looking athlete but every time you turn around he's having multiple catch games cranking up towards 100 yards it's like a baby giraffe has great hands that's how i kind of yeah he's, he's kind of knock kneed so he looks a little weird he's not one of those like hyper athletic sprinter types he doesn't need to be he's really effective and detroit gets him for free uh obina easy the offensive tackle from tcu Massive physical gifts, great length, long way to go. He's a developmental prospect, but again, you take a shot, it's free in UDFA. Uh, Demetrius Taylor, one of my all-time favorite players in this draft, not just in the UDFA class. I actually thought he would get drafted. Speaking of sawed-off shotguns, real short, real wide, built like a bowling ball, and uh, moves like a cannonball. Like, shot out of a cannon, more penetration plays tackles for loss pressures sacks at appalachian state then you can shake a stick at yep. always around the ball always causing a mess that other people were cleaning up or he'd clean up himself really surprised he didn't get drafted just on production and physical traits alone he is on the shorter side he's just at or maybe a hair under six foot um just a just shot out of a cannon every play. He Dan Campbell's going to love him, 100%. And then Jermaine Waller, the cornerback from Virginia Tech, who, again, we got to see at Shrine Bowl, and a lot of guys that we talked to, a lot of receivers and tight ends that we talked to, uh, you know, hey, who's standing out to you at practice? And they didn't they didn't know names yet because guys coming in from all around the country after a four-month break, and they're like, I don't know, that 22 from Virginia Tech, man, that guy can play. Yeah, that's Jermaine Waller. So uh, another versatile secondary piece that they can plug in they have tons of them their secondary depth is not like their linebacker depth they have guys on guys so waller will have a tough time making the 53 but even if he sticks on the practice field or the practice squad he's got good size great mobility a lot of experience playing inside and outside at virginia tech great great pickup in udfa I love this UDFA class. Uh, the Taylor pick I thought was great for the Lions, maybe not great for Taylor, just because when is he going to play? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> There's so many defensive tackles. Like their rotation is now Brockers, McNeil, Onwuzurike. Um, We really liked uh, Jay Sean Cornell a couple years ago is like, you know, one of the sleeper day three guys and he's still hanging around. Then you got Demetrius Taylor, who was, I mean, your, your, your favorite drafts guy, your favorite draft analyst favorite draft prospect <laughs> seemingly yeah. in april like everybody yeah. was like you know this demetrius taylor kid's pretty fucking good like yeah. and then he ends up going undrafted and going to a 
one of the deeper DT rotations out there. So again, great for Detroit, maybe not great opportunity for Taylor specifically. Um, Derek Deese, again, another, they didn't need him at all. Nope. You got Hawkinson, you got Wright, who's going to be on the roster forever because he's a blocking tight end. Uh, and then you got James Mitchell, who's got a ton of athletic upside. Unless they plan on carrying four tight ends, which I don't think they will, I would imagine he's like a primo practice squad candidate and they just hope he gets through waivers. But I think he's definitely, he's worth the stash. And if somebody gets hurt, I could see him getting called up at some point this season. Josh Johnson, though, I think is is really the the crown jewel of this UDFA class. I think if he's going to play, it's more likely early than late. Well, Jameson Williams is still coming back because I don't. I, I, I've seen the workout videos from Williams and I know there's optimism. I'm not 100% certain he's going to be ready by September. I think they'll probably want to baby this thing. And, you know, maybe yeah. by October, November, somewhere around there. So if Johnson's going to get the call up, I could see it being early on in the season, and then if we're rolling out in 11, it's DJ Chark, Amon Ross St. Brown, and then probably Josh Reynolds with maybe Josh Johnson as the wide receiver four as your injury insulator. Quintes Sivas is still there. Khalif Raymond is still there, but I think Johnson's a better separator than both of them. So I think he could very easily be wide receiver four early, and then when Williams comes back, either he's back to the practice squad or wide receiver five somewhere in that general realm. But he's really shifty off the line, really explosive was one of the tougher covers at Shrine Bowl, which had some pretty talented DBs there. Um, he's going to make it in the league. And I, I think that Detroit's a good opportunity for him, but I, I do think he's going to make it. He's going to try and push Raymond for the punt return role as well. They've got, Oh, Khalif I can see They've got Khalif Raymond listed as their punt returner. And Josh Johnson, again, that was how he caught our eyes. We walked onto that corner of the UNLV field and we're just watching four guys who we didn't know who they were yet. You know, we've been there for 10 minutes and within the first two returns, within two two cycles of that drill, it was like, that's the guy right there. <laughs> that's the guy with juice. That's the guy you want to pick up on special teams to give your team a boost. If you're going to get a wide receiver four or five, he's got to play special teams. Josh Johnson, more slightly built, but really good acceleration, good toughness. Um, I would say despite the size, because he is not filled out yet. He's going to need a year in NFL conditioning to get a little bit bigger. But, you know, that's the kind of guy you can bring in. He can give you a couple of sparks field position wise. Again, I love the term injury insulator um, filling in while Jameson Williams, who I do think they're going to be very careful with because they wanted him so badly. And because he is such a, a jewel of this particular draft class for them, they're not going to rush him back to the field. They have no need to. So Johnson could slide in there really because of his special teams ability. And then he's, he's going to retain his practice squad eligibility and, and rotate back. So to get a guy like that in UDFA for no draft cost, Great, great work by Brad Holmes and his staff. All right, final segment, team floor, team ceiling. This is their perceived floor in wins and perceived ceiling in wins. As we kind of get ready for training camp to kick off, I think the Raiders actually start camp tomorrow as of the time of us recording this. So we're then again, the Raiders are playing uh, Hall of Fame games, so they're a week early. Yeah, but... I was going to say new coach and Hall of Fame game, so they get all those early exemptions. By the time this airs i think it's going to be in the first week of lions camp i think but we'll see either way heading into camp season generally this is kind of the the ceiling and floor we actually agreed on this one minimum six wins because they're a better team now than they were last year and everybody's more experienced and they should have won six games last year (laughs) like the absolute bottom fell out in terms of just hard luck and they, they they should have very easily been six wins last year. I think the changes this year are worth an extra three if the bottom falls out again. Um, I just I can't imagine them being a an absolute garbage team again with all the talent they have. I think it'll be a average to below average team. And then 2023 is where we're looking to make the leap. At ceiling, specifically because of their schedule, they play a lot of good teams. I have them at nine. You have them at nine as well. But would I be entirely shocked if it was more than that? If even us, who are high on the Lions comparatively, are still underselling them? Would I be shocked by that? Absolutely not. I still have it as a nine-win ceiling because I don't want to, you know, 
fall victim to my own hype too much, but it's a good team, man. And if they stay healthy and if, if the ball just bounces differently for them this year than it did last year, yeah, they could absolutely push for a seven seed and I would not be shocked by that at all. We talk about regression to mean a lot uh, with things like turnovers and sacks. And I think the regression to the mean for Detroit and wins is up this year because it was as depressed as it could possibly be last year. All the bounces were bad. Even some of those go their way. They're up to our floor. A few more of those go their way and they push with more talent and a second year in the system. Again, stack three more on top of that. So while we say nine wins and that may sound like dissing them for how much we've just spent the last hour talking them up, this is a team last year, total touchdowns 35, four, 52 against. To say that team's going to turn around and threaten for double-digit wins is a huge improvement. If they get mm-hmm. nine wins, it's an over 500 season for the Lions, for a team that, again, on paper, won three games last year. Yes, could have won six, but that's still in the middle. That's our floor. If they go another three on top of that, stack nine, they're over 500. They've made a six-game improvement, and likely they are threatening for a playoff spot. That would be massive progress in Detroit. So don't take the single-digit win total as any kind of diss. We are very encouraged by what we've seen in Detroit, both from the coaching staff, the front office, and on the field. It's working, it's moving in the right direction, and it could accelerate quite a bit this year. I'm excited. I'm excited to see it both on TV and live when I'm in the uh, the frigid cold of, of New York in December because for some reason I only go to New York when it's snowing. The last three times I've been to New York, it's all been under 20 degrees, and I, I think this will probably be the same, but it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be a good game. Can't wait to see it live. Can't wait to see the Lions in general. And... Um, and I say this as somebody who does, you know, root for the Bears and everything like that. I I always find pleasure in seeing terrible franchises ascend and kind of, you know, lift their fan bases up with them. God willing, we'll see that for the Bears sometime soon. But I think the Lions are maybe a little bit further along on that track than we are. Um, it's just, it, it's good to see. And I think Lions fans have been through a lot. I think they're ready for at least having some, some hope here. And in 2022, I think it's going to give it to them, but that'll wrap it up for today. Uh, tomorrow, speaking of the bears, we're going to be doing our bears episode previewing 2022 and the ungodly slash and burn that's been going on in Chicago to try to get rid of all these terrible contracts. Uh, like I said, the Lions are further along in the process than Chicago is. Might be a, might be a couple years before we get to have these encouraging conversations about our Bears, but we'll get there one day. They, they've, they've done some good things so far, and we'll talk about those tomorrow. But uh, until then, stay happy, stay healthy, see you in the morning, and until then, later. Take care. Take care.